Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm Leanne Jackson, senior law editor at Forbes. And today I am with Professor Mary McCord. She's the executive director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection at Georgetown University Law Center. I am pleased to have her joining us on uh, the day after Election Day. Uh, we just had Kamala, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, she presented her concession speech on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C. I know that Professor McCord was watching that as well. And I'm very interested to get your take on a number of issues now that um, President Trump is back in office. There's a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns, especially in the legal space by uh, legal experts, legal observers. So I want to talk uh, a little bit about that. What are your What's your perspective on what we can expect uh, starting in January, the first, as they say, the first 100 days? What are your expectations? I mean, you're coming from a perspective of constitutional advocacy and protection. So I'd like to get your take on this. Sure, thanks. Well, first, uh, thanks for having me. And also, I just want to say he is not in office yet. <laughs> It'll be January 20th. So we, you know, there is this transition time. And there's a lot of work that has to happen, you know, for a transition. And that's the one, one of the things that Vice President Harris said today in her concession speech is that her, the administration would be working for a peaceful transition, right, to help um, Mr. Trump get up to speed before he retakes office. Um, so my organization, ICAP, uh, we, the title is so long, we use ICAP. Um, you know, we started in 2017 and we brought a variety of different constitutional litigations, some of which were against the Trump administration for things like uh, the public charge rule, the rule that his Department of Homeland Security promulgated that would make it exceedingly difficult for people to get green cards. Um, other things we litigated about the citizenship question on the census. Uh, we litigated about the apportionment uh, decision that he or policy that he attempted to implement. But we also litigate lots of other issues too, like criminal justice reform and First Amendment and separation of powers. I think we'll see more of these types of things, very aggressive, I mean, we know it because he's promised it, very aggressive immigration enforcement, including in, you know, he has said mass deportations, that's gonna be an area of litigation without question. He has talked about um, political prosecutions against his political enemies. He believes that this is what happened to him and that he will provide retrib retribution. And that's very concerning, a weaponizing not only potentially of the Department of Justice, but other agencies like the IRS, for example. And combined with the immunity decision, which is a little bit of a license to abuse uh, your office if you're the president and, and be immunized for it, that's sort of a dangerous combination, that in, in combination with what he has said he would do. Um, he has talked about using the military in, for domestic law enforcement in ways that are very troubling um, and uh, invoking the Insurrection Act, which of course is an important law that should be used for certain purposes, but I question whether the his statements about using them against, quote, the enemy within is actually a purpose that was ever what was um, anticipated by the Insurrection Act, short of something like, you know, the Civil War. Um, so these are all things that many of us who care about protecting democracy and constitutional rights for all Americans um, and everyone in this country, uh, those are things that we will be watching for and when litigation is an option. Um, that's something we and other lawyers will be considering. Considering, yeah. Well, there there are um, there's a certain group of legal, large group of, of legal observers and and um, litigators who worry about an abridgment of the rule of law. But then there's another segment that says this is all sort of um, hand wringing, perhaps hyperbolic. How do we find what is what is the the truth between those two? I mean, Jack Smith. Also, this is sort of, sort of a separate question, but similar related. I mean, Jack Smith. You know, I guess based partly on the Supreme Court's immunity decision, he will likely be winding down his cases, uh, two cases against uh, former President Trump. But how much do is it likely that he will take the steps that he's threatened, that he's said in the last four years that he's been out of office versus mm -hmm. a little bit of angst on the part of legal observers? So I think um, I think well remains to be seen, but I do think that there is a certain part of um, Trump's rhetoric, 
particularly over these last th four years, and then even more so during the campaign, that is about being kind of hyperbolic, being very provocative. And I don't expect them that he will make good on everything that he has said he would do. Uh, for one thing, he didn't do that the first term, right? There are lots of things that he talked about doing in his um, in his campaign uh, time before he was elected that weren't completed. I mean, the wall, building the wall and having Mexico pay for it is one example. Yes, he built small little portions of the wall, but nothing anywhere close to what he had promised when he was campaigning. So I think it's entirely possible that he will pull back on some of the more extreme things that he has uh, been talking about doing on day one and shortly thereafter. I also think there are things he's talking about doing that, frankly, he just can't do on his own. And even though there's a lot of, you know, talk and speculation about the fact that he's much more likely, and I, I happen to agree with this, he's more likely to surround himself by people he perceives as more loyal and more willing to do his bid bidding, not people who are going to tell him no, don't do that. That wouldn't be lawful or that wouldn't be uh, in conformance with norms right throughout our history. Even even if he put, brings in people who are more willing to cast those norms aside and those norms are what the rule of law is about. Um, I, it's still he can't do everything on his own and with just a, you know, a few advisors. I mean, if he's going to try to use the Department of Justice against political enemies, that's going to take more than just his political appointees. It's going to take line prosecutors uh, down at the level of the U.S. Attorney's Office or the, you know, um, line levels of the criminal division. It, it will take investigators willing to engage in potentially baseless investigations, grand juries willing to indict baselessly and courts uh, willing to go along with things and, and, and you know, not um, uh, dismiss cases that are unfounded. And that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of moving parts to make that happen. Mass deportations, right? He's going to have to have people to make that happen. People that would, you know, go into communities and round up immigrants at least purportedly, and some sort of mechanism for the deportations, right? And so these are not things he can do overnight. These are not things he can do on his own or with a small circle of political appointees. So I, I, um, I don't think it's wrong for people to be pointing out some of the very extreme things he's promised, but I do think we need to step back and, and realize that he's unlikely to be able to accomplish all of those things, irrespective of what he has said during the campaign season. And, and to your point about the mass deportations, which of course was popular with his base and was partly why he um, was really bringing that up over and over again, uh, they, you know, the current administration has said they don't even have enough money to, to staff and to, to accomplish the de minimis things that they're trying to do now. So his goals may or may not be able to be accomplished from a budgetary or personnel or even, as you said, um, the uh, authorization to do so on his own. At the same time, there are valid concerns about the rule of law. And to your point also, when you mentioned a lot of this would have to be rubber stamped by, by the judiciary whether it's line line attorneys at the U.S. Attorney's Office, there's also the judiciary. And I do want to ask you about mm -hmm. this because when he was four years in office, he was able to remarkably uh, adjust the uh, federal judiciary, mm -hmm. Supreme Court, of course, as well, but even at all the federal courts. And now he has another four years to do so. And as we've seen with even Jack Smith's investigation and other court cases against former President Trump, that can really move the needle on the rule of law. If you capture the courts, that's one mm -hmm. of the straight, straightest lines to, tr to destabilizing sort of um, democracies and the rule of law, as we can see around the world. What, are, what can we expect uh, in terms of opportunities for him at the judicial level from bottom to the top? So um, there's no question with another four years, he's going to make a, a, an even more significant impact on across the federal ju judiciary from the district court level to the circuit level to likely another appointment on the Supreme Court. And he already had a remarkable three appointments in just one four year term, which is very unusual. Um, so. Uh, there's no question there'll be that impact. And certainly there's also no question that there have been certain judges he's appointed that at least, you know, some uh, legal, um, you know, some lawyers and litigators like myself are critical of. Um, and that's usually the case. You know, we always have some judges with whom we dis disagree and we think that they've made decisions the wrong way. I will say, though, um, I, I, you know, there are plenty of Trump appointed judges who are solid 
uh, respected, competent, neutral judges. And you've seen that through so many litigations. I mean, four years ago in 2020, uh, they threw baseless challenges to the election out of court, right? Um, we've seen even just this election, judges, in fact, I think it was a um, federal Trump appointed judge in Georgia who, uh, you know, um, actually, no, I don't want to conflate my cases. I'm not sure if that he was the one ruling keeping um, keeping uh, polling places open. Now, let's scratch that because I think that was now Pennsylvania. I can't. Was that Pennsylvania? Remember. That might have been Pennsylvania, but I'm not positive. No, Pen either. Pennsylvania was different. There was a judge okay. in Florida or in Georgia, Georgia. yesterday who, who agreed to keep all of, but I think the judge in Georgia was a Trump appointee, was the one who rejected a different. Um, cha oh, I know what it was. Yes. Um, a Trump appointed judge in Georgia, I believe, was the one who, you know, rejected the the litigation to try to not accept absentee ballots over the weekend, for example, just kind of toss that out. So there's been lots of judges, uh, Trump appointed judges who I think have have you know, done exactly what we expect of them. So I, I'm not ready to paint that broad brush that, oh my gosh, everyone he appoints is going to be a disaster because I don't believe that to be the case. There are certainly some, and I, I will say, honestly, from my perspective, Judge Cannon is one of them who I think has um, not faithfully applied the law uh, to the cases, to at least the the Trump-related case in front of her. And, um, uh, but, you know, there's been plenty that I, that, that um, have been, solid judges. And I, and I do think it's a shame sometimes the way that we always at attach the president who appointed a judge to the judge as though that is going to tell us definitively how they're going to right. rule in any case. We know a lot of times from they history. don't, whether it's a Democrat, yeah, whether it's a Democrat appointed Republican, right. sometimes you're surprised and shocked at, at right. the outcome. So that is good to know that it's not always going to be a rubber stamp and green light, depending on uh, who gets appointed and, and how they're vetted. Uh, I know you, your your um, institute also does a lot of criminal justice reform, and this is a little bit of a, a digression, but I have questions about the federal death penalty, which, of course, mm -hmm. Trump uh, ramped up um, full scale for the first time in decades when he became um, president. And I guess, mm -hmm. and then, of course, Joe Biden, um, that didn't happen under the Biden administration. I guess we can expect that that's something that we um, retroactively will be um, started, or not retroactively, but started again under uh, President yes. Trump. President Trump is back in office. I mean, this is one of those areas where um, I think, you know, the law, uh, the what's lawful and, and what is potentially implemented through policy decisions by an administration is just way behind, behind where the public is. Um, and I think, you know, there's been plenty of research that shows that most of the public, and I, and I don't have the research from just like this most last six months or anything like that, and could be that this is changing given given Trump's own rhetoric, but I think that there's plenty of research um, from recent years that the trends uh, very much in this country are against capital punishment. So to, you know, restart that at the federal level, you know, would be very disappointing. That said, there are not that many um, federal level death penalty cases. It's much more, um, uh, often something that's out in the states, uh, state prosecutions under state law where the death penalty is instituted. It's really a fair, a fairly small um, number of cases where it's a federal defendant facing the death penalty. Well, staying on the topic of criminal justice, um, there are a number of uh, January 6th militants who were convicted uh, in federal court and an opportunity for uh, once he becomes president again for Trump to pardon those. Has he spoken about that at all? And on the same to topic of pardons, pardoning, trying to pardon himself or get someone to pardon him for, he's, he's already been convicted in state court, but, and Jack Smith's investigation is not going anywhere at this point. But um, mm -hmm. what, do, what do we know about what can happen with pardons once he becomes president again? Sure. So, I mean, he has the constitutional authority as president to pardon those who have been already convicted um, uh, with respect to the attack on the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. He also has the ability as the head of the executive branch to direct his Department of Justice to dismiss all the pending cases where people have not yet been 
um, convicted uh, and direct that no more cases be brought under his um, administration. He has that he has that authority and the pardon authority is absolute um, from the Constitution. So, you know, we have procedures that the executive branch has implemented in the Department of Justice over years where normally in a normal administration, pardons are reviewed by the office of the pardon attorney on a very much of an individual case by case basis and a recommendation made by the by the pardon attorney uh, that, you know, eventually makes their way to the desk of of the president. But uh, Mr. Trump showed us in his first administration, he wasn't always really too concerned about going through that process and some of his pardons. He just made them without going through that process. So I think with when it comes to this is also an area, to be honest, where I think he may pull back some of his promises. I mean, at various times, he's used various language. Yes, I'll consider, um, you know, pardoning those people. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. And so it could be that he will, uh, you know, have some second thoughts about whether he wants to do a blanket pardons, maybe whether he wants to just try to restrict pardons to those who committed only completely nonviolent offenses like uh, trespassing, um, uh, who knows, but he certainly does have that power. Now, when it comes to himself, um, not only can he direct his Department of Justice to dismiss the January 6th case pending in, in district court in DC and to dismiss the government's appeal of Judge Cannon's dismissal of the Mar-a-Lago um, uh, documents case, he can direct that, but I don't, he may not even need to direct that uh, because even in this interim period before he takes office, it's the Department of Justice long time policy under both Democratic presidents and Republican presidents, the Office of Legal Counsel has always taken the position and it's binding on the Department of Justice that they, they cannot prosecute a sitting president. And so there's certainly not time between now and January 20th to get um, either of those cases through trial. And so I suspect that they will get wound down even even before Trump is able to direct that they be dismissed and, and uh, just under department d- department policy. The delays that uh, partly Judge Cannon was um, uh, helpful to the Trump uh, tr- Trump campaign in a lot of ways with the delays and a lot he uh, definitely benefited from a lot of uh, time that uh, so that his yes. cases weren't prosecuted at that level and now it remains to be seen uh, what happens next which of his uh, promises or some might call them threats that he actually that will come to um, actuality and is there anything that you're looking out for uh, in a second term uh, from uh, once Mr. Trump does become president that you think especially from a legal perspective, what um, experts will be looking at to just to see what happens mm-hmm. next? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm most concerned about is something I raised right at the top of the interview, which is the misuse of the military. And I think, you know, our military leaders throughout history have tried to be completely nonpartisan. That is what we want (laughs) from a military. Um, And uh, so they have spoken, including back during his first administration, after really, I think, some serious mistakes were made, even appearing with with Donald Trump at Lafayette Square during the protest activity of that summer after George Floyd was murdered. I think uh, those military leaders regretted having taken part in that because they did not want to be sending that message of sort of having a political position. Um, So I think that that's an important point for military leaders to continue to reiterate because the things that 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 president elect trump has been talking on the campaign trail about doing really would be a misuse of military authorities for domestic law enforcement whether we were, are talking about you know um Uh, taking part in mass deportations or border law enforcement operations or going into, as he has said before, going into mostly like democratically controlled uh, cities to actually enforce, uh, do law enforcement because of what he perceives to be rising crime problems. And and notably, actually, crime is down. In fact, illegal migration is also down right now. Um, Those are things not only would it be a really horrible precedent to have our military be engaged in that type of activity, but they're not trained to do that, right? They're trained for combat zones. Um, They're trained to go generally abroad into combat zones. And so they're not expert in things that are, are, are state and local law enforcement 
and even our FBI, our federal law enforcement get trained in like First Amendment rights and Fourth Amendment rights. So we're asking, he would be asking really way too much of them and putting them in a horrible position to be using them for domestic law enforcement and particularly where it's just not necessary or warranted. So I see this as an area where that's fraught with um, danger uh, not only to sort of, as we were talking about earlier, you know, rule of law and the, and the, and the uh, integrity of our institutions, including the institution of the military, but also danger for Americans who might get sort of, you know, caught up in uh, police action by military um, soldiers. So that's a strong red flag area to keep an eye on the use of sort of an usurping executive power to control the military in means that have never been done or not usually done domestically. I'm sometimes the National Guard during certain certain situations, but on a regular basis, uh, we will see if that is something that Mr. Trump decides to um, change. And also that's something that a lot of autocratic uh, governments have utilized. Sure. So hopefully we don't go down that path, but we will be keeping an eye on all of this. I know you will as well, and I appreciate you joining us and flagging all these issues, talking about um, what we can look out for and what we can hope to see and, and what comes next. So thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I hope you will talk with us again soon. My pleasure.